All right, everybody, thank you for joining me today. I am here with Coach Van Taylor. He is the former um, head men's soccer coach over at Lander University, now the current director of athletic development. How are you doing today, Van? Doing well, Jess. How are you? Not too bad. Hanging in there. Hanging in there. <laughs> I think we all are. We're all trying to uh, adjust to uh, these challenging times, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. How's the uh, weather out there in South Carolina? You know, we've had a great spring, uh, a little longer than uh, usual, which has been nice. Um, the pollen, which is typical of this uh, part of the country, was not as much as it has been. So uh, we've had a great spring. Weather has been, been uh, temperatures have been uh, warm, but not real hot. So it's been good. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. yeah. We'll see. We'll see what happens in the summer months. I know I've been out there in the middle of summer. It gets kind of toasty. <laughs> it sure does. Yep. Awesome. All right. Well, I kind of want to jump in and I want to learn a little bit about you as far as your coaching background, because I know you have awesome um, coaching history. So if you could tell us how you started, um, how you ended up at Lander and where you are now. Well, I originally grew up right outside of uh, New York City in North New Jersey and had a really rich and, and uh, good background in the game. Um, would recommend just as a sidebar, there's a movie, U.S. Uh, Soccer USA, U.S. Soccer Town USA. It just has just come out. Um, and I would recommend that people watch that. It's the youth club that I played for back yep. in the uh, late 60s, early 70s. And it, it, it uh, follows John Harks, Tab Ramos and... Uh, uh, Tony Miola, their uh, rise to, uh, you know, stardom that started with that same club that I played for when I was a youth player, but um, played high school soccer, uh, had a great uh, coach. We won the state championship that year, went on to college, played at a small school in South Carolina, Erskine College back in the uh, early 70s. And uh, then I was fortunate enough to play 10 years uh, professionally, both in the North American Soccer League and the, the forerunner of today's MLS, and then also in the major indoor soccer league. And then I came to Lander uh, in 1985, and I've been here 35 years, uh, coached for 30, and then transitioned uh, into this uh, current position uh, where I'm uh, helping raise money for scholarship and athletic initiatives and those kinds of things. Very cool. Very cool. What were the names of the teams that you uh, played for professionally? Well, I uh, was fortunate to be drafted by the uh, what was then the New York Cosmos in the North American Soccer League and then sold to Miami. And I played for the Miami Toros, and uh, they were owned by Joe Robbie and Elizabeth Robbie, who owned the Miami Dolphins. Okay. And then they moved the team from Miami uh, to uh, Broward County, and they changed the name from the Toros to the Fort Lauderdale Strikers. So mm -hmm. I played in that inaugural season there. And uh, that was a great experience, being a former goalkeeper. Uh, they brought in probably, um, you know, my... my uh, favorite goalkeeper of all time, Gordon Banks. And I had the opportunity to play under him and, and learn from him. And then from there, I went two years in the American Soccer League with a team called the Columbus Magic. Mm -hmm. And then I ended up uh, playing uh, one half of a season in Baltimore in the MISL. And then I finished uh, four and a half years with the uh, Phoenix Inferno. Nice. And then came to Lander in 1985. So uh, yeah. it's, been, uh, it's been fun. Yeah, the rest is history, as they say, right? There you go. There you go. Very cool. Um, all right. So you had to have coached and played under um, a lot of great people. So I'm super curious to hear um, who your coaching mentor was, who kind of had that profound impact on you um, throughout your playing and now coaching career. Well, I think at every level, whether it was high school, uh, my high school coach was very well known, uh, Ralph Dugan, uh, my college coach, Daryl Saunders, uh, some of the professional coaches along the way. But I think the number one uh, person who had the greatest influence on me was my youth coach, and that's Manfred Schellscheid. And anybody in the game of soccer, he's in the U.S. Soccer Hall of Fame. And uh, in fact, when you look at the um, U.S. soccer coaching schools and the coaching license, there's numbers assigned to uh, those those uh, certificates and diploma. And his is number one. His is the first one to get it. And, and what's important to that to me is that I remember as a youth player, our team went on to some of those coaching schools and were the demonstrators. So we had a coach who had an influence on us as players. Um, and then we go to these coaching schools and we're seeing the same things we're seeing in training to reinforce those same principles and, and so forth. But outside of that, Manford is just, uh, he's just a great man. In fact, we're getting ready to celebrate um, a 50 year reunion coming up uh, shortly. And it was a team that was um, had so many um, wonderful players. Um, 
have uh, Bobby Smith, who played for the Cosmos, uh, Santiago Formosa, uh, Glenn Marinick has passed away, but Mooch, who everyone knows, was on that team. And I, and I could go on and on, and I'll forget them all, but it was a great team, and Manford was the reason. And so uh, I would say Manford Chelshide had the, the has had the greatest influence on me, not only as, as, as a player, but as a person. He's just a... He's just a wonderful man. We love Manford. Yeah. We nice. called him Manny. Manny is how we, what we refer to him as. So. Yeah, that's awesome. And you guys, you said he's still around. You still keep in contact yeah, with him? Yeah, he's, uh, he's in New Jersey. And um, he's, uh, he's I'm sure he's finding a five-a-side today somewhere, even at his age. And uh, yeah. But uh, he's he's had a, a great influence on a lot of players uh, along the way. Yeah. Oh, well, that's really awesome. Um, I like it when you can stay in contact with old coaches and um, or old players even when they come back and they let you know that you had a profound impact on them as well. So it's very cool. Yep. Nice. Um, now, what is probably the coolest atmosphere that you've ever played or coached in? Wow. Okay. Well, great- you know, again, uh, if, if I looked at every level of my play in uh, high school, winning that state championship, against um at that time was Hal Township but we had beaten Carney in the semifinals which is they were dominant during that era so that was a a wonderful uh, experience uh, college uh went to the final four in the NAI that that um that during that time um you know even professionally i think probably the game that stands out is um at Yankee Stadium um, it would have been in 1976 and it was against the New York Cosmos i was with Miami then and uh and playing against the legendary Pelé and 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 you know all the the players for the New York Cosmos, so probably that game on a professional level would stand out the most. Yeah, coaching on a college level, probably when we went to the Final Four in 1990 in the in the NAI, uh, it was our last year as we transitioned from um, the NAI to NCAA Division II membership, and uh, we um, went to the Final Four that year. In fact, we lost in the um, semifinals to uh, West Virginia Wesleyan. Um, and they went on to win the national championship. So I, I would say as, as a coach, that probably is the most memorable. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about what the atmosphere is like? Because I know soccer is very unique in that, you know, I've been to professional games and I've watched high school and, and college games, um, and it's just very unique. So can you talk a little bit about the the atmosphere that you guys get to play in and kind of how, how cool it is? <laughs> Well, you know, in the early days of the NESL as a, as a forerunner of today's MLS, and, and, you know, I went to an Atlanta United game um, last year, and I, I, it was, I don't know, 70-something thousand, and, and the atmosphere was electric. And we had those kind of games from time to time. I remember um, when I was with Fort Lauderdale, um, we played at uh, Giant Stadium, and at that time it was the largest crowd in professional soccer. It was about 77, 78,000 people, so great atmosphere. But then I can remember playing in the uh, Los Angeles Coliseum, a stadium that holds 100-plus thousand, and there was maybe 5,000. Yeah. And um, so so we, you know, there's a contrast there. But, uh, you know, I would say playing, you know, um, in those early days of the NASL where – um, you played in uh, some some really nice venues, whether it was in, in New uh, Yankee Stadium, whether it was in Giant Stadium. Um, uh, those are real memorable to me, for sure. Yeah. Sounds like it. That's pretty awesome. Um, uh, the, yeah. in, the indoor game was a little different because you know you're in in stadiums and venues where they're on top of you. I can remember playing in um, St. Louis in the Checker Dome, and those. I don't know what that held the the the, the attendance 16, 15, 16,000. and those stadiums were always packed and that's a different kind of atmosphere too because you they're right on top of you and that that, that was fun also but uh you know um, the game was really well supported uh, then and and it's so nice to see uh you know where we have gone in the game both yeah. on the youth professional levels. Yeah, absolutely. It's nice to see it continue to grow um both on the men's and women's side seeing that that become more important in America, I think, than it was kind of back in the day. So, Oh, absolutely. And I know I'm speaking from the men's side, but you just mentioned the women. Look what they have done. It's just absolutely fantastic. And, uh, you know, we're proud of what the women have done, uh, not only for the game of soccer, but, you know, representing our country. So, yeah, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Now let's kind of talk about uh, recruiting for a minute so that we can give these kids an idea of where they can go. Um, Can you chat a little bit about um, your favorite recruiting story as a coach, um, bringing in a player and how that sort of panned out for you? Yeah, you know, that's recruiting. That's that's an interesting animal. Um, 
I guess one one thing that comes to mind early on when these recruiting services had had begin to to come into play, and there's so many of them now, and anyone in a college game, a coach knows that. And it was early on in that process where someone had contacted me and was trying to get a player to come. And, you know, back then, very little uh, film and, you know, you're, you're relying on, you know, reputation and, and just, you know, maybe a resume, if you will. So we took a chance on a young man who was from Bulgaria. And I say that now loosely because he graduated from Lander and was a three time All-American. Mm-hmm. was the leading scorer in the country for three years while he was here. By the way, he um, he graduated in three years. It didn't take him four years. He was, oh. a, he was a smart young man. And his name was uh, Stilion Shishkov. And Stilion has a uh, multinational, international company in Bulgaria called Sportal uh, BG for Bulgaria. And it's, it's, it's an online media and print media and uh, all has to do with sports. Mm-hmm. That, that probably would be my best story because here we took a chance on someone and um, and he ended up being just a, a you know, three-time All-American, leading scorer in the country. He's in our College Hall of Fame. And I guess I use that as, an, as a launching or an, as an example of another that sometimes you put a lot of energy into a player and time and effort, and it just doesn't work out. Yeah. And in that case, with Stilion, we, we didn't do a whole lot. And he just sort of, if you will, fell in our lap and it ended up being just a great success story. So, you know, and, and I'm sure other coaches can share their their similar stories where, you know, the kid that, you know, didn't know what to expect and was just a great player. And then, as I said earlier, uh, maybe put a lot of time, energy and effort and really wanted this kid and it just didn't work out. So uh, yeah. that probably that, that sticks in my mind. Yeah, absolutely. So let's kind of chat about how um, these kids can start that process of, of building that relationship with you guys. What do you guys kind of look for as far as, um, you know, communication with players? What should they do? Well, it's interesting you mentioned that. Here I am five years out, um, and I'm still getting recruiting letters sent to me, dear mm-hmm. Coach Taylor. So first of all, do your homework. Find yeah. out I'm not coaching anymore. But that I use that as an example because sometimes – they'll say dear coach and they personalize it, but then there's, you know, they've copied it to 10 other coaches. So just make sure you do your homework, personalize it. Um, Communication is so important. Do your homework, do your research, make sure it's a good fit. Um, You know, do you want to stay in state, out of state? Do you want to go to a big school, a small school, private versus public cost is important. Probably the most important, and it is the most important is meeting your academic needs. You know, for example, if you want to major in business at Lander, you're going to get a really good education. But if you want marine biology and we don't offer it, well, then that's not going to be a good fit. So make sure the school's meeting meeting your academic needs first and foremost. Make sure you communicate with the coach. You know, that process needs to be started uh, early, not your senior year. Because, um, and I, 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 I talk to a lot of women's coaches uh, in the game and their, their recruiting cycles even earlier than the men's, if you will. So, I would say, you know, make sure you start the process early, do your research, and then communicate with the coach. Make sure you're updating them on game schedule, whether it's club, whatever level you're playing at. And um, make sure you just keep those lines of communication open. Make sure you visit the school. I think it's important that you see the school, if if at all possible. Um, And then continue to just uh, keep those lines of communication open with the coach and, uh, and, you know, he may be asked for, you know, a video or he might want to get your game schedule. He may be coming to see you, a home visit, whatever the case may be. Just make sure you're always uh, communicating and staying in, in front of that coach, if you will. Yeah, absolutely. Um, now's a good time to do that. I think kids should be doing the research now that they have a little bit extra time while they're at home in this off season um, to figure out where it is they want to go. Because a lot of times, like you said, they'll send out an email and, they don't know anything about the school. They know nothing about the coach and they just are hoping for that scholarship. But I think they need to look at what they want before they start thinking money. No question. And I, you bring up a good point. This being, you know, this this challenging time with the, the COVID viruses, it's challenging on both sides, you know, for, for the coaches to recruit because, you know, they're, they're grounded. Schools aren't allowing them to get out. They're having to do everything online, virtual, video. And so it's it's a new uh, the new norm, if you will, and it's going to be challenging going forward. And I, and and we keep talking about going back to normal. Uh, I guess we're talking about as normal as it can be because I'm sure we're going to continue to have some social distancing etiquette and other things that are going to just continue on. 
handshaking, what have you. So, yeah, I think uh, coaches and players are going to have to adjust to this going forward. But you're right. Now is a great time to be putting together some of those videos, put your resume together, contact coaches, stay stay in front of the coaches. Yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, now let's talk a little bit about videos. You mentioned that those are some things that kids should be sending out. Can you kind of talk a little bit about what it is that you guys look for in video? What do you like to see when they send it over? How long should it be? Sort of things like that. Yeah, it's a great question. And I, I think it's a, you'll, you'll probably get a different answer, you know, 10 different answers from 10 different coaches. So I think it's important, just what you said, find out what that coach wants. Maybe someone wants, you know, full 90 minutes. Now I can tell you, there would be no way if I'm having 30, 40 players contact me that I have the time to look at 30, 90 minute games, 40. So for me, I do want to see some continuous play. The uh, the highlight films, you know, obviously you're highlighting everything that goes well, and that's fine. That, that gives you somewhat of a picture. But um, I'd like to look at some of that, but I also want to see some continuous play. So, you know, if you're a, a, a midfielder. I want to see you certainly on the ball and off the ball. I want to see I want to see what happens in possession and out of possession. So for me, um, although I don't want to look at a 90 minute game, I do want to uh, see some continuous play. Um, maybe that could be for 30 minutes, you know, a third of the game um, and then maybe some highlights. Uh, goalkeeping, you know, I'd like to see a little bit of training. I want to see some of their training habits in addition to the game. Because, again, um, you know, the goalkeeping is going to be much different in terms of videotaping than the field players. But with that said, um, again, it goes back to communication. Find out what the coach wants. And I shared perhaps my philosophy, but another coach is going to maybe want that 90-minute game. Yeah. You know, and they don't – or maybe, nope, they don't want anything except highlights. So yeah. I think it's a matter of just, um, you know, finding out what the preference is. Yeah, for sure. Um, and that goes back to communication, right? <laughs> as long as you're you're talking with the coach and seeing what they want. And, you know, if you send something that a coach is like, I don't really want this, but they want to know more, they're going to reach back out and ask for it. So um, I, I, I would say give them something. I always liked to see some sort of film because that caught my eye. And then I could go back and say, hey, do you have, you know, a longer full game film I can check out? Do you have something else? So as long as they have something, you know, tangible to be able to share, I think that's helpful. Yeah, I think you're right. And what that does, you just said the best word, you, you want to get their attention. Hey, you know what, I want to I want to see some more of them. And then they can communicate, hey, Lane, send me more game film or I'd like to see you more in a training environment or whatever the case may be. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Yeah. Um, now, we talked about the new normal coming up here. So I wonder, uh, I want to get your take on what kids can do to maybe create a video while they're at home and send something. You know, maybe they don't have these full game videos at this time and they might not for the foreseeable future so you know what are your thoughts on maybe putting something together at home that they can still share so that coaches can can kind of get an idea of their play that's a great question um you know here at the university we've done everything we can to stay connected to our student body uh we we've made calls out um our alumni association has put together so many different uh you know videos and blogs just trying to stay connected i think to the point um, what can the players do? And then on the other side, what can the coaches do to stay connected to the players? And I know I'm all the time getting a short little, um, I, I know Dan Gasper, if you know anything about goalkeeping, he puts out and it's just three, four minutes, might be just basic handling. Um, um, you know, so there's, there's a lot of different people out there putting short videos together on the coaching side, but similar, I think players can do the same. Um, one of our former players, um, Louis Motherman is the uh, executive director of the Baton Rouge, and they are putting out things for the, on behalf of their players, the backyard, just, you know, doing some type of training. But uh, I think it's going to be limited, no question. And I think, too, you know, obviously coaches want to see more of the player than just something in the backyard. But I think, as you said earlier, if that is just the starting point, it's an attention, you know, attention getter then they can go back to maybe some old video. But, uh, and yeah, and that's happened before. You might have a player send a video that's six months old, but if that's the new norm right now, until we can get some kind of, a, you know, up-to-date video, maybe put together something that catches their attention and then maybe use some old video. But um, yeah, I think that's the challenge, both from the coaching side, hey, what can we do to keep our players connected? And then on the player side, hey, how can I get the attention of a college coach and others? You know, because a lot, of, a lot of clubs are starting their tryouts and they've been grounded. So, you know, they're 
They're wanting to, all this is, is all, all trying to be figured out. I know in um, South Carolina here, um, they're not resuming play until June. And in some states, they're going to resume the, the, the league and try to finish it up and get state cup in and et cetera, et cetera. So yeah. I know on the college level, there's talk about maybe even limiting the amount of games next year. Just, just, there's just a lot of unknowns. And so we're all navigating this together. So I, I, I don't think there's a real right answer to that question, but I think anything and everything at this point that you can do to stay in front of the coaches and as the coaches side, stay in front of their players, um, it's going to be beneficial. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's going to come down to the kids, I think, being proactive anyway. They should definitely not just send one email and think they're done. Um, so whatever they can do, like you said, to kind of just stay in front and um, see what happens. That's what we're all going to have to do at this point. Exactly. Exactly. Now, uh, when you are watching video or even when you're out, um, you know, recruiting out on the field, what are some intangibles that you're kind of looking at when you're trying to find some players for you? Well, you know, the, before you get to the field, you want to make sure that the student athlete you're recruiting is going to be a good fit academically. I mean, uh, making sure because, you know, obviously you want players and that's why you're recruiting the player. But you also want to make sure they're a good student. And then I think, you know, the intangible, you're looking for character. You're looking for kids that are committed to their education, kids that are committed to and have a passion for the game of soccer, yeah. kids that are coachable. You know that that uh, you know want to learn, grow, and develop. Um, and then you watch. I always watch. Uh, you know, how does a player uh, respond in a game when they give the ball away? You know, looking at how do they deal with adversity? They've just given up a goal, or whatever the case may be. So, you know, f those are some intangibles that sometimes are um, you know uh, more subjective, but at the same time, I think you can uh, garner a little bit more about the player. But I think from my philosophy, I'm looking for good people. Certainly looking for good students and I'm looking for good players. And then, uh, you know, I'm going to meet the, the family. I'm going to talk to their coaches, you know, as much as they're doing their job to find out about the coach they may be playing for. Yeah. Coaches are doing the same thing because, you know, it's four years. You know, I'm not looking for chop and change and bring a kid in for a year. And it'd be criminal if I brought a kid in and he played four years and he didn't graduate. Because, you know, the overwhelming majority of kids that come out of college are going to go on and start a career and raise family and all that. So, you know, my job is to prepare them for that. Um, I'm as competitive as anybody. I understand, uh, you know, the wins and losses. But um, I think if you take care of the kid first and those types of things, you know, the winning and all that will, will follow suit. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's one of the, the biggest things that we want to let athletes know, too, is that it's not just about soccer or insert sport. You know, it's not just about the sport. You want to love the school you go to just in case something happens and you can no longer play. Um, and the biggest thing is that you're going to graduate. You're, <laughs> the hopes, yes, you would love to play professionally afterwards, but you should really be wanting to get that degree so that you have, you know, a career that you can start once once you're done playing. It's a, I think that's a great point. And I think I'm a perfect example of that. Um, my, my college coach, Daryl Saunders, and I went to Erskine College. My senior year, I was drafted in the NASL. And, um, you know, they started the preseason and I was thinking about leaving school and the whole thing. I'll finish it later. And my college coach was able to do both, able me to finish long before online and you know, virtual learning and what it is today, but just wor worked it out to where I could finish my degree and still start a professional career. And I'm so thankful for that because I'm here today because of that. If I didn't have that degree um, or what if I did go and play and had a career ending injury or a number of other things could have happened, I would not have had anything to fall back on. So, you know, I had the benefit of having a great education, securing me for, you know, something in the future after playing and uh, had I not done that or not completed the degree, I wouldn't be able to coach on the college level anyway. So um, I'm thankful for that good advice. And I'm thankful for my uh, my college to work th at that time wor worked with me. Yeah, absolutely. Um, now, Van, I just want to leave you with one more um, story that you can maybe share with our players. What was like one of your favorite um, moments out of the last few years coaching at the college level? Can you think of um, a team or a game or just something fun we can leave them with. Oh, wow. You know, uh, my, my high school coach could remember, you know, 
uh, verse and song and chapter of every play that took place in a game. I'm not, uh, my mind doesn't work that way, but, uh, you know, we played in so many big games over the years and, and, and that, that's really speaks to what our program and I say ours, um, our current coach, and I'll mention him, Lee Squires, if anyone's interested in Lander, please contact, you can contact me, but, uh, coach Squires has done a great job and, uh, and it continues to build and, 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 you know, we're looking, our goal is to win a national championship. So, um, you know, I think it's important that, um, um, you stay, you stay in touch, but back to your point, your question earlier, um, you know, some big games along the way, um, we won championships and that's what our program is all about. You want to be in an environment where every year, at least you're setting yourself up to compete for a championship, whether it's a league and we're in the Peach Belt Conference, which is a very competitive conference, whether it's going to the next level on the regional level or even on the national level. But, uh, you know, just playing in some of those uh, NCAA championship games, um, you know, I remember we played um, Clayton State the last game of the regular season at home and lost in overtime. The following week, we played them in the conference final and lost to them by a goal. And the following week, so three weeks in a row, we played them in the first round of the NCAA tournament and we beat them. Oh. Uh, so I, I look at that as an example that, um, you know, just you, you want to, um, if you're going to come, I hope you're interested in Landry, you, you know you're going to come into a competitive environment. You're going to get a good education. Coach uh, Squires is going to look after you, make sure you earn your degree. You're going to be competing for championships. And, you know, I don't think it gets any better than that. Yeah. Absolutely. I completely agree. <laughs> now, I appreciate you sitting down with me today, Van. It was really great to get to talk to you and, you know, get to see another another human uh, during this time. <laughs> so, um, I appreciate you and uh, hopefully we'll get to sit down and chat again soon. Great. Well, thanks for having me on. I enjoyed it. All right. Thanks. You're welcome.